Well, good morning and welcome to the Village Church. It's wonderful for, to have you join us on TV2 or on Facebook Live or maybe later on our YouTube page as well. Um, you can find our service uh, on Facebook uh, throughout the week and on YouTube throughout the week. And it is replayed as well here on, uh, on campus at the Evan Christian Village on TV2. Um, I'd like to run through some announcements for you for this week. Uh, if you need a worship guide to follow along with us for service, we can um, make those available through email. Uh, if you'll just call the office and let us know what your email address is. Uh, and if you live here on campus, they're available uh, in multiple places throughout campus, whether that be the Dowling House or Carter House lobbies, um, the Information Center, or down at the Copeland Community Center. So uh, if you need a worship guide to follow along, um, that would, uh, we can make sure that you have one of those. This Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we'll be re releasing our next uh, Creation Arts Camp on um, Quarantine Edition. Uh, we'll be making a kaleidoscope with watercolors. So um, you'll need a, a few things. Uh, and, uh, you'll need some paper, an empty toilet paper roll, some watercolor paint, and a paintbrush. So uh, if you live here on campus, those uh, will be on TV2 Wednesdays and Friday, right after our thought for the day. And uh, for those of you who are watching on uh, Facebook Live, it goes live at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, so we encourage um, families and children to get together and work on that project together, whether that be at 10 o'clock on Tuesday or wherever uh, you uh, have time to do that uh, together. I do want to remind you again of uh, our graduates that will be graduating. Um, they're actually going to do graduation on a very limited basis uh, in town with a limited number of people on the 30th. Uh, when we'll be honoring our three graduates, Esther Coombs, Bethany Maybe, and Lily Lamb. Uh, and then we do, we'll be doing that uh, Sunday morning and uh, Sunday evening on the 31st of May. Uh, if you'd like to send cards, you can bring them to the church and I'll make sure that they get them. Uh, or if you have a, a um, village uh, telephone book, I believe all of their addresses are in there as well. This morning we've uh, come to worship the Lord. And as we do that, I'd like to help us join our, ourselves together in, in one heart and one mind to focus on the Lord by uh, responsive, responsively reading our call to worship. And it starts out with all of us together. So let's call ourselves to worship from Psalm 9. Give the Lord glory and honor. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. Give the Lord glory and honor. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give the Lord glory and honor. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Give the Lord glory and honor. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns indeed. The world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Give the Lord glory and honor. Let us continue as we give the Lord glory and honor through song. Let us sing, To God be the glory.
God's Word from the New Testament. Gospel of John, chapter 15, reading verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. May God's blessing abide with the reading and the hearing of His Word. What I've learned while sheltering in place. While sheltering in place, I've learned that the less I have to do, the longer it takes to do it. I've learned that my hair grows much faster when I have no idea when it can be cut. I've learned that the first week we were concerned about food. The second week we were concerned about entertainment. The third week we wondered how much our grandchildren would change before we saw them again. And now we're only thinking, do we really need to vacuum the house? I've learned that the rule for staying six feet apart is much easier for strangers than grandchildren. I've learned that Facebook Live, TV2, and YouTube are great ways to keep in touch. I've learned that Facebook Live, TV2, and YouTube are lousy ways to keep in touch. I've learned that having anything to look forward to It's better than having nothing to look forward to, even if it's doing the laundry. I've learned that I'm a procrastinator, even when I'm truly bored. I've learned it becomes easy to focus far too much on things of absolutely no consequence. I've learned that while the most intelligent people have many right answers, In these situations, the questions keep changing, so the answers don't fit. I understand the phrase, abundance of caution, when it comes to sheltering in place, wearing a mask, using hand sanitizer, staying six feet apart. I've recognized, though, that all along I should have had an abundance of caution in making sure my friends knew about the Lord. I've learned that the whole world can be affected by something too small to see, hear, or touch. But we have many who still don't believe in a God who made the sunsets for us to see, the laughter of children for us to hear, and the sweet touch of a hand to hold. I've learned that there are more times than we ever knew that prayer is all we can do. And I've also been reminded often that prayer is all we need to do. I've learned to appreciate even more the overwhelming love of a God who has provided for us long before we ever knew we had the need. Thank you, Karen Hall. 
Ex Lucado said, Our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. Let us pray. Father God, we lift our hearts to You, acknowledging You as our God. Acknowledging You as the forgiver. And through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, You have provided a means of forgiveness for our sins and a cleansing. And we pray that we might be forgiving in our relationships with one another. We praise You, God, for Your mighty power your perfect love. We praise You because You are majestic and Your glory fills all the earth. We thank You for promising to be with us, to always be there. And we pray that we would never take for granted this special promise for us. We ask You to heal those who are sick. To comfort those who are afraid. And those who are facing uncertain medical diagnoses, we pray for strength and comfort, Father. We ask You to protect those in the medical field. And we pray, Father, that You will give our leaders knowledge and wisdom to lead through this pandemic. We ask You, Father, to use the church to share Your love. And we do pray, Father, that You will lay a burden upon our hearts that we might share Your love with our friends, our neighbors, our family. Father God, we need revival. We pray that You will use the events of the quarantine, the isolation, the events of this time of uncertainty to bring revival, to work things according to Your will, will and purpose. You told us in Your Word, if My people who are called by My name will humble themselves and pray and seek My face and turn from their wicked ways, then You would hear from heaven. You will forgive our sin and You will heal our land. We thank You, Father, that You're faithful to every promise. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. and We thank You for the portion of Your Word that says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from You, O Lord. You're the one who made heaven and earth. You will not allow our foot to be moved. You neither slumber nor do you sleep. You're the one who keeps Israel. You are our keeper. You are our shade at our right hand. Indeed, the sun will not strike us by day nor the moon by night. You will preserve us from all evil. You shall preserve our souls. The Lord, You, O Lord, shall preserve our going out and our coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. We rejoice in Your love and thank You for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, Amen. Somebody somewhere needs Jesus today. We take things for granted as.
as we go on our way, not knowing that someone may need him today. It may be touch and go, and they need you to pray. Is there someone you know who needs Jesus today? Somebody somewhere needs Jesus today. They need to feel His touch. It's a special Somebody somewhere needs Jesus today. We must tell them He loves them and can meet every need. He's the answer to every problem. He hears every Somebody somewhere needs Jesus today. They need to feel His touch in some special way. They need how He heals. They need how He saves. Somebody somewhere. Somebody somewhere, somebody somewhere needs Jesus today. Need Him today. Amen. Let us continue as we sing. Come out, come out, King.
We'll hear again from the word of the Lord from 1 Peter chapter 2, where he writes, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. I'm wearing this for effect this morning here in the sanctuary, not because I feel unsafe, but I wanted to draw attention to the fact that I am grateful to so many people who voluntarily made these masks and provided them for us. I'm starting to feel a little bit sensitive about it, however, because I've been given four masks by people, and I'm concerned that uh, they're not only concerned for my welfare, but about a beautification effort. The more they can cover this mug up, the better they may feel about things. Uh, I don't, don't know about that. But isn't it interesting, I, I, I'd say fun, trying to figure out who people are from a distance uh, as you approach them. We wear these masks, of course, to protect ourselves, but I find myself asking over and over again, who is that? I mean, I, I, I was in the process of trying to learn everyone's name here at the village. And I was a long ways from accomplishing that. But then you throw into the mix that everybody starts wearing a mask. And I don't have a clue who they are. And so I'll, I'll wave at people and then I'll ask myself, who did I just wave to? Who is that person? We're all scattered out. And for good reason, we're adjusting to a, a different rhythm of life. And I thought Karen addressed some of that just beautifully in, in uh, her testimony this morning. We're grappling with not being with people, and that's a struggle for all of us, especially for any of us who are kind of social in our nature, but I think we're all wired to, to be with people. Uh, some of us may enjoy that more than others. There has and continues to be somewhat of an apprehension, a certain element of, of fear, uh, especially, you know, with some of the early projections that perhaps millions of Americans would die from this pandemic. And... Um, it's been an interesting time for us. It, it's been a time that we'll reflect on in years to come with our children and, and, and grandchildren. And uh, we'll, we'll speak of this in days to come. Do you, rem do you remember back when, you know, we, uh, we couldn't get out and see people? Do you remember when we couldn't touch other people and uh, when, when we had to practice social distancing? Well, those things have benefited, there's no question about it. Are, are they convenient? Are they comfortable? Not in the least. <laughs> Not in the least. Uh, but it, it's the times in which we are living. And I'm, I'm grateful that we've gotten along as well as we have. But I, I couldn't help but think as I was looking at the, the text that I'm going to address for us this morning, uh, that uh, I think to a large degree addresses who we are in God's people. As God's people, I, 
I couldn't help but think that, you know, I didn't have a, I've, I've waved at people this week and had no clue who I was welcoming and, and, and greeting and didn't know what their identity was. And likely they didn't know who I was either. It's okay. It's okay. But we have an identity and we have an identity with God. And Peter addresses that in his letter to the believers, the first century believers who had been scattered here and there by the outbreak of persecution against the church. And in, as Peter addresses that, addressing their needs, encouraging them and, and, and trying to uh, ward off discouragement, I suppose, as uh, they were facing challenges that you and I honestly can't relate to as they've been displaced from their homes and their jobs and all that was normal for them. Of course, some of, some of us and some who are listening to the sound of my voice this morning may be able to relate to the fact that they've been displaced from their jobs and, uh, and, and some bad stuff is going to happen as a result of this pandemic. But in the first century... Peter addresses believers, fellow believers, who are going through some challenging times. And the Holy Spirit gave Peter words of instruction, words of encouragement, to remind them that they had a hope that was eternal, to remind them that they're a chosen people, that they're loved by God, to remind them who they are in the eyes of God. God isn't in any way confused about who we are. Wearing a mask or not, God knows who we are. And, and so he uses the Apostle Peter to, to speak into the lives of people who are hurting, who are challenged in, in their living, who are threatened in their living. And they, again, he reminds them who they are in the Lord, and he reminds them of their purpose, even in the midst of the difficult scenario that they find themselves. We always have a purpose in God. Uh, and we always have a pur purpose in our lives because of who God has made us and His intentions for us. And so I want to address some of what Peter says here in the second chapter of the book we call First Peter where Peter writes and he says, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Uh, one of the things that I observe as I read that, that Peter clarifies that his readers first century and now, his, his readers are a people with a past. Now we, when we speak about somebody having a past, we, we normally think of it in terms of uh, negative terms. Somebody who has lived a, a, a dubious life, someone who has perhaps led a disreputable life or questionable life, somebody that has a dark history to their life. And, and Peter really addresses that because in truth, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a dark past. The scriptures are pretty plain about that. Uh, Peter says here, you've been called out of darkness into his wonderful light. And we're reminded that we've been called out of the darkness of sin into a new way of living. We've been called out of the guilt of sin into God's glorious forgiveness. We've been called into the light that He brings into our, our lives. Uh, the book of Proverbs says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Now, that's darkness. That's darkness when the, the path that we're following is going to result in death. And Peter is telling us that all of us as Christians come out of that kind of background. And maybe I'm speaking to some today 
And that's still the path that you're leading. I pray that your hearts would be open to the one who would lead you into his marvelous light, who could give you hope and, and, and cleanse your, your heart through and through and, and, and give you a means for living. That's what God does. That's, that's the way of God. We have a dark past. Peter also points out we have a despised past. He says, once you were not a people. There was a point in time when you had no identity as a people. Once you were a nobody in the mass of humanity. Once you were outcasts, you were alienated from God by the choices that you had made, by the standing that you had before Him. You were part, we were part of a fallen human race. And Paul describes it as having been enemies of God, our sins separating us from Him. That's part of our background, brothers and sisters in Christ. A dark past, a despised past, a doomed past, Peter points out here. Once you had not received mercy, he says in verse 10. And without mercy, none of us has any hope. If I've got to count on my goodness, if, got, if I've got to count on the things that I have accomplished, if I've got to count on my ability to do more good things than bad things, in order to be right with God, I'm in big time trouble. I was going to say I can't speak for you, but I can speak for you in regard to that. We're all in big time trouble if we are dependent upon our own merits. But rather, we are dependent upon His mercy. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. John writes in 1 John 5, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. The Son is the expression of God's mercy to us. We have a past, but Peter points out to us that we also have a present standing with God. He says, you're a chosen people, chosen by God. Ponder it for a second. Chosen by God. I'm, I'm blessed, our family is blessed that one of my siblings has three children that uh, she adopted. And they are a source of great pride and joy to her. That, that wasn't something that she and her husband had to do, but it was something that they chose to do out of the goodness of their heart and a sense of need and a sense that God might use them in this way. Likewise, God in his marvelous grace and mercy has chosen us to be part of his family, his adopted family. Can you can you picture God introducing His adopted children, those that He passionately loves and adores? Well, Peter tells us that's part of our standing today. We're chosen by God. We're called a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. In the Old Testament, God set apart the tribe of Levi to have a special relationship to the nation of Israel. They were a tribe of priests, and it was their job, it was their calling to come to God on behalf of the people and to come to the people on behalf of God. Now what might that mean to us to be called part of the priesthood, a royal priesthood? Well, among other things, it means that we have direct, direct access to God. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come boldly to the throne. We don't need someone else to pray through. And while we may invite someone to pray on our behalf, we can offer our prayers directly to the Lord Himself. We have unrestricted, unhindered access into the very presence of God who made this world, the universe, and all that exists. Ponder that. 
whoever you are, whatever your background, that God would see fit that you could have direct access to him. You know, I might, I might want to speak to uh, someone in the White House, but I doubt seriously I'd get direct access to them. But I have the opportunity to have direct access to someone far more significant and important. I can come to the throne of grace any time that I want to. We don't need another mediator. We have one in heaven, and he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has broken down all barriers that once stood be between ourselves and the Lord. And so as part of the priesthood, and I'm not talking about professional priests at this point. I'm talking about the fact that all believers are priests on behalf of the Lord. We have access to him, but we also have a responsibility to minister to the needs of other people. The priests would represent God to the people. You and I get to do that as followers of Christ Jesus. We can come before the Lord on behalf of others. Gene and Sandy sang for us earlier, uh, uh, alluding to that, that we can pray on behalf of others and others can pray on behalf of us. And as, as part of our priestly responsibility, Christians, we come before God on behalf of other people. We have direct access to him, and we have access to people, and we can serve as an intermediary to introduce others to the king that they might have direct access to him. We're also called a holy nation. And the first century believers, as, as Peter spoke to them and wrote to them, he called them a, a holy nation, and I... In, in weeks prior to this, I've, I've tried to clarify that holiness has to do with being set apart. It has to do with being something different than the mainstream culture around us. We, we are called to be different. We're set apart on purpose for a purpose, for God's purpose. The Old Testament tells us that the nation of Israel was set apart by God, for Him. He placed them at the crossroads of the world and they were to impact their culture. But there were times in their history when they didn't want to be different. They didn't want to be set apart. Other nations had kings, so they wanted a king in spite of the fact that the Lord didn't want that for them. Other nations had idols. And there were times when the nation of Israel gave in to the worship of idols. But that wasn't God's desire for them. And so Peter is specific here in encouraging these struggling believers to remind them of who they are, that they are a people set apart by God for himself. And he had a purpose for them. And I would remind all of us this morning, that we too have a purpose in the Lord and he has set us apart for his purposes and for himself. We're under new ownership, under new management. There are, unfortunately, there are going to be a lot of businesses, place of businesses and the fallout of all that's taken place. They're going to find themselves under new management and under new ownership. Well, we as the people of the Lord or under new ownership, if you will, new management. Peter says we're a people belonging to God, belonging to God. The, the old King James translation used to render that a peculiar people. And I personally used to have some fun with that. I'd, I'd look at some of my friends and say, they got that right about you. You're, you're a peculiar person. But the real meaning of that word peculiar had to do with the, someone or something that was a purchased possession, a unique possession, something of rare beauty, something that is of a priceless nature. 
God's saying that about you. You have that standing with him. That brings to my mind something that was recorded in the book of Malachi, in the words of the Lord. And he says, they will be my people, says the Lord. On the day when I act in judgment, they'll be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. God feels that way about you. You're a special treasure to him. You might feel demoralized this morning. You may be discouraged. I, I think the rhythm of life that we've been pursuing, that we have to continue to pursue, is challenging and difficult to us. I, I think uh, life, even before this, has a way of beating us up. But just reflect. Reflect on the standing that you have with the Lord. You are a treasured possession of his. You are a precious people. Value is often determined by what someone will pay for something. And you know, there are market prices that, that change the value of things, but ponder ponder what God has paid for you. He gave his son that you might have a relationship with him. He sacrificed his only son that you might become part of his family and experience adoption into his family. Value is also dependent at times upon who has owned something in the past. If you come across a book and you find that it was owned by Abraham Lincoln, it takes on much more value than the, than the face value of that book. If you come across an old desk and you find that Winston Churchill own that desk, the market value on that goes up immensely. Well, we are treasured and we are the personal possession, if you will, of the Lord Most High. And He treasures us immensely. You know, it is tragic today how little human life can mean in so many places and to so many people. Every day, every day, unborn children are destroyed who are treasured by God. And oftentimes that takes place just for convenience sake. God help us. Every day, young women are bought and sold as, as though they were a piece of furniture, used as objects of entertainment and personal pleasure. And God forgive us. God forgive us for, for this taking place that people could be bought and sold in that way. Every day murders and rapes and other acts of violence take place because human, human life means so little to so many people. And Peter tells us here that once we were a despised and worthless people, but now through the blood of Christ Jesus, we are a prized and precious possession unto the Lord. If you've ever lost something of great value, you can relate to Luke 15, of course, as the, the, the stories there, three different parables are shared of how the Lord seeks us out. In, in real life, certainly something of less value than people I can recall an occasion, I'll, I'll let my wife give you the details of it, but I recall an occasion when she lost the diamond out of her ring that I had given her as an engagement ring. Those were some frantic uh, moments. Uh, I think it stretched out more than, than moments, but she desperately wanted to find that. It, that. That was even before I knew it was missing. But... Uh, God treasures you even more than that. Peter goes on to express in the 10th verse that, yes, we're, we're, we're a, a royal priesthood, we're a people of God's own choosing, but he, he shares something there that I found significant. He says, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
And if I could add my understanding to that, I think we see here described for us that we are forgivable and we are forgiven. I don't want us to miss that this morning. We are forgiven in Christ Jesus. God doesn't rub our sins in. He rubs them out. (laughs) He doesn't rehearse our sins over and over for us as they are forgiven. He releases them. We, We get historical with other people. I don't mean hysterical. I mean historical. We're, we're quick to point out what they have done and how they have offended us and how they've come up short as we measure it. Aren't you glad that God doesn't do that to us? Our sins are wiped out. We're not held accountable for them. They are forgotten. They are gone. They are erased. They are treated by the Lord as though they never existed. God is in the business of forgiving sin. And so if you're wrestling under the weight of guilt this day, I would remind you that there is a God who can remove that guilt. And you can have a fresh standing with Him. Today, now, as you bring it unto Him. Years ago, I remember reading a story about a a wealthy English merchant who had a great deal of money, and he he only liked the nicest of things. And so among his possessions was a beautiful Rolls-Royce coupe. And it served him well for a number of years, but then one day he hit a big pothole and a rear axle on it broke. And so he had the car shipped back to the folks at the Rolls Royce plant. And he was surprised, even shocked, that uh, almost overnight the car was shipped back to him repaired. And there was no bill included. And so while he was amazed at the the service that he'd received and how quickly they had responded, but he was concerned about what, what this was going to cost. So he called the company and he, he inquired about the repair and, and he inquired about the cost. And the, the person on the other end of the phone call said, we have absolutely no record of any Rolls Royce ever needing to be repaired. And so therefore there can be no charge. Uh, The company was so committed to excellence, so committed to the quality of their product, that they didn't keep records of such as that. The whole situation was treated as though it never occurred. Isn't it great to know that God will treat our sins in a similar manner? Yeah. He rubs them out. He doesn't rub them in. And so it is with God's mercy. When we bring our sin before Him in confession, God offers to us the abundance of His cleansing to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west, put behind His back, cast into the deepest sea, never to be removed or remembered again. And at no charge to us, but at a tremendous charge to God. So we're people with a past, Peter says. We're people who have a a present standing with God. But Peter didn't stop there. He went on to say, you're people with a purpose as well. In the midst of your struggle, in the difficulty of your lives, Peter writes, God has a purpose for you. In the ninth verse, He says, God God has chosen you, has set you apart, you belong to God. And he says, he did this that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And then in the, the 12th verse, he says, therefore, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. 
Yeah. He's told us who we are. He's told us who we were. And he tells us now, here's how you ought to live. And here, here is your purpose as you move forward in your lives. We're heaven's salt and heaven's light in a rapidly decaying world. God has a purpose for his people. God does a show and tell with his people and through his people. And some of you who can remember back to your childhood when you went to school, or some of you who are involved in education, you may have gone through the experience of having children bring objects into the classroom to show and tell their classmates about whatever it was. I can, I can remember in the little town where I grew up where my two older sisters took me as their object of show and tell. I'm not sure what point they were trying to prove, but uh, I, I recall a day that they, they took me to our little school. God does show and tell with us. We're to show the world round about us and tell the world round about us what God can do in lives who would submit themselves to him. Peter says we're to declare the truth about our Savior. Declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light, his wonderful light. To declare, that has to do with our voices, to vocally make known what the Lord has done for us. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things that I couldn't help but think of with projections as, you know, in the millions of those who in our nation might possibly die from the pandemic, and I'm so thankful that those projections have been way, way off, but it just reminded me, unfortunately, a lot of people without the Lord are going to pass out of this life, and they're going to have to face judgment without a Savior. God's Part of God's purpose for us as his people is to make him known. To be able to share with other people, this is what God can do for you. This is what God has done for you. And you can enjoy the benefits of what he has done. We have the opportunity of opening our mouths and, and speaking about the wonder of who the Lord is. The wonder of the provision that he's made for us, the wonder that God wants us to be part of his family and live with him forever. We declare that with our mouths. Now, later in 1 Peter, as, as Peter addresses the, the need and the expectation for us in giving a defense of our faith, he clarifies how we're to open our mouths for the Lord. He tells us that we're to do it in a gentle way and do it in a respectful way. And uh, I certainly think those principles apply here as we represent the Lord in the things that we say and how we speak to others on behalf of Him. We ought to do it with an element of gentleness that doesn't remove the fact that there needs to be a clarity and there needs to be a firmness at times, but in a gentle manner and with a great deal of respect, treating other people as though they're precious in the eyes of God as well. Not speaking down to others, but speaking to them. As I've heard it said, as one beggar telling another beggar where to find food, we get to speak on behalf of the Lord. Peter says we're also to demonstrate the truth of our salvation. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, we don't fit, we're different, we've been set apart for God. I urge you to abstain from sinful desires that war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you for do, of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. That there will be something about our living 
that they can, they can recognize that God has done something and is doing something in their lives, that our lives can affirm the testimony of our lips and the testimony of His Word. John put it this way as he, he spoke about the hope that we have in the Lord. John said, And everyone that has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Knowing the Lord has to affect how we live. Now, we don't get it right perfectly. And we all live inconsistent lives. But we pursue lives that honor Him. We continually pursue that. So our testimony, there's a, there's a vocal side of it, there's a visible side of it as well. We're called to a pure walk. We're called to a powerful witness. He speaks of them seeing our good deeds and glorifying God as a result. I'm thankful that I've been able to witness with my own two eyes so many times the, the life of faith lived out in people round about me. Again, never perfectly, uh, ne ne never without mistake, but I've seen it so, so many times. I remember reading the, a testimony years ago and this, the person put it in a manner that it stuck with me and I wrote it down. And this is what he said. He says, I've been greatly impacted by the words of many followers of Christ, but it has been the lives of Christians that has made their message believable. The lives that they lived made what they were saying believable. When they spoke about a God who can change hearts, a God who can pull together relationships, a God who can heal hurts. The life that they were living made that believable. I saw it lived out in them. Peter calls us to live good lives around those who don't share a faith so that ultimately they'll glorify God as they come to faith. In him. In one of his books, Max Licato writes about an incident that took place as he was in the process of trying to record a message that was to, to go out as part of his ministry. And uh, he and the camera crew went down to a public park and he was sitting on the bench, and the camera crew and the audiovisual people were sitting up their equipment and it's a public park so other people begin to notice it they're looking over at him and, and finally one passerby a, a lady who sees this and who is puzzled and, and she's one of those people if she you know if she has a question about it she's going to ask it and she looked over at, at Max and she yelled out to him hey mister are you somebody important and and in his book he 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 reflects on the fact i don't know how he responded in that moment but he reflected on the fact that while there are times when he might wonder himself if he was somebody important as he looked at the pages of scripture as he looked at the testimony of what god has done for him there's no doubt he's somebody important. And so I want to leave that thought with you this morning. You are somebody important to God. He treasures you. How you have responded to that fact. But I want you to wrestle with it. You are a precious, precious person in the eyes of God. He loves you immensely. And He wants you to live with Him forever. Respond in faith. Respond in love. And if you're already a believer, I hope you'll respond by being encouraged today. You are somebody important to God. 
Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that in even our most challenging times, we're not forsaken by you. We, our plight is noticed by you, and you watch over us, and you care for us. I thank you for the purpose that you have for our lives. I thank you for the hope that we have because of Christ Jesus. Lord, may these words today sink deeply within our hearts and minds. And may we be moved to trust you. May we be moved to to love you, love you even better today as we ponder what you have done for us in your Son. Be glorified, O Lord, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is Now I Belong to Jesus. Let us sing. face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen. Amen.